Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get started and others may join in. Um, welcome to our porch workshop. I'm Susan Keeney with Columbus Landmarks, Columbus's preservation nonprofit that cel it's celebrating its 45th anniversary this year. Uh, the home preservation program that I direct guides homeowners throughout the city on repairs and maintenance of their older homes that respect and preserve the home's architectural character. As our thoughts turn to spring, especially on this lovely day um, and warmer weather awaits us, sit back and enjoy the photos of beautiful porches all throughout our city. Most of them are from homes that we, we've all passed by, I'm sure, um, and learn about their evolution, style, and some maintenance best practices. So nothing enhances the character of a house like the front porch. Porches add the kind of details that define the character of a building, its age, use, and significance in the community. Today, we'll talk about how historic porches, um, look, you know, how they evolved, a little brief history about that, review some important design features, some architectural styles and terminology and construction methods, and we'll look at maintenance issues and discuss a few methods for repair and replacement of lost details. So the American front porch um, is probably one of the most character defining features of a house. Um, it provides protection, of course, uh, of the front entrance, connection to the street, which is really the eyes on the street that contributes to safety, actually, and also transition. It's, it's that outdoor room that creates that little walk-off space between the outside and before you enter your house. So when a porch is missing, you know something is not right. Um, the, uh, the home feels naked. And this is a before and after shot of a multi-unit house. Of course, it's now renovated. Um, the new paint palette certainly helps, but the added front porch and also the front door uh, certainly makes this house beautiful. It says, welcome. So a little bit about the history. Um, we'll go to the, uh, right now to the words uh, that are derived from uh, the, the words for the front porch from the Latin porticus, from the French porche, and also porticos, which are roofs that are supported by many columns. Um, you'll see a couple of the most famous porches in the world right here. The ancient Greek Parthenon on the left was built between 447, 432 BC. It was dedicated to the god Athena and it cost about 469 warships to build, which I, I'm not sure how that translates into dollars, but it's a lot. The Pantheon on the right, was commissioned by the Roman Emperor Marcus Agrippus during Agrippa during the reign of Augustus, 27 BC to 17 AD. It was completed by Hadrian, who also built many temples to make Athens a cultural capital. So notice the columns on these, and in, in particular, the capitals. We'll be talking a lot about those later on. So, on to the Roman architect and engineer Vitruvius, who wrote a building guide on architecture between 30 and 15 BC. It was called his 10 books on architecture. In that, he also explored the human body, namely the geometry of perfect proportions. Vitruvius believed that structures must have three things. First, stability, then utility, and lastly, beauty. Nice, nice uh, uh, visions and goals for, for any, any period of history. Vitruvius's writing influenced none other than Leonardo da Vinci, who explored the idea of perfect proportions further. The famous drawing of his Vitruvius man um, in 1497 shows the proportions of the human body um, within, within a circle, within a square. And that the geometries of proportion share something in common with the production of a good building. This was their belief. Now we'll fast forward to, um, to the Americas, which received the influence of the front porch from the British during the 1700s and 1800s. England, of course, had many colonies the world over, and they had long experienced the verandas and shed roof porches of India. They knew the broad roofs supported on wood posts from the Caribbean and also Africa. 
But when the, the porch idea came to the Americas, um, they were a little bit smaller scale, more on the uh, realm of small gabled roof extensions. And these porches, of course, were common mainly in the wealthier urban environments. As the country grew and became industrialized, more money and more leisure time uh, was experienced by all. It became affordable to construct more elaborate ornamentation on houses, and there was a growing middle class. One of the most prominent design professionals of the time was someone named Andrew Jackson Downing. He was a designer and primarily a landscape architect, not really an architect, but he wrote a house pattern book called Cottage Residences, and this greatly influenced house design. It was extremely popular. He believed that Americans deserved a good home, every American. Good design should be accessible to all. His book featured house plans for three basic forms, farmhouses for the farmer, cottages for the working class, and villas for the wealthy. Now, you might not know Downing's name, but you might know the name of those he influenced, including one Frederick Law Olmsted, who created the plans for Central Park in New York City and park community plans for cities throughout the country. So he, he was a strong influence of the time. The Great Porch era of our country came during the second half of the 1800s through the early 1900s. In fact, many of our older neighborhoods here in Columbus were developed during this time. And so there are, they are the great beneficiaries of some wonderful porch designs. The development machines of machines such as lathes and jigsaws allowed more elaborate ornamentation to be created. And sometimes we call that carpenter Gothic. Um, and there was also the hygiene movement of the time, a period when access to fresh air was important to fighting tuberculosis and other airborne diseases. And I just love the diversity and creativity in all of these porches. There's not a one that's alike. Well, then we went to experience kind of a decline in porch design. Um, and that, that was the later in the 20th century, we had cars that uh, became uh, more prominent and it was easier to get away from entertainment. You just didn't have to sit on your front porch. Uh, we had the television and air conditioning, which uh, enticed people to spend more time indoors. And then we had outdoor patios where the focus wasn't so much on the front of the house, but on the back of the house for our entertainment. But more, more recently, we see a trend back to porches uh, in our cities and communities because there's a desire for safe, walkable, pedestrian-oriented, attractive neighborhoods. And, and that's just good urban design. Things like uh, you know gardens preceding the porchways. I mean, it's just a nice introduction. And you see the streetscape, it's just so pleasant to walk down. So let's talk a little bit about porch anatomy. Um, so it derives from the Greek, three basic parts. Um, we're gonna we're gonna start um, from the ground up, and this is a little bit complicated drawing. It shows every piece's part, but we'll just look at some of the major ones. So you, as you construct the porch, you'd start with the base, you'd move, and that's the foundation. You move to the deck structure. You'd move to structural support, which are the columns, and then to the roof structure. So here, you know, along the base, you'll notice that there are piers, elements of the base are the piers. They go down to 36 inches in our, in our city. That's the frost line so that we don't have frost heaving, which can ruin the stability of porches. Uh, in between the piers, you have the skirting. And then, of course, you have the fascia boards around and the deck structure, which is composed of the joists and beams. On top of that, you have deck material, which typically was wood, and then supporting, uh, then the supportive columns, which are everything from the wood through the capital. Now, a lot of the wood columns were supported direct, had direct support on the piers, but sometimes they rested on the deck structure itself. And then above that is called the entablature. It's a big word. It has um, many different, uh, it has several different components, the architrave, the frieze, and the cornice. We typically 
talk about cornices when we talk about this element. And above that is the roof structure, which are the joists and beams, the sheathing and the roof, roofing material itself. Sometimes there were additional uh, little porches on top, like a second porch that kind of repeated the materials that were used on the lower porch. Um, one other thing element that we want to note is the, thing, the, the railings or the balustrade that runs between the columns or supports. Um, we, we typically just call this the porch rails, but the entire thing is called the balustrade. It's got a top rail, a bottom rail, and these vertical members, which are called balusters. So there you have the porch anatomy. So now to the, um, the columns. And, and this is where we go back to the Greeks because they set the classic order of columns. And when we talk about the anatomy of a column, we're talking about the base, the column itself, which includes the capital and the shaft, and then the entablature, which we mentioned before with the architrave, frieze, and cornice. And here's, here's a lovely example of Corinthian columns. This is in the university district. So you've got the entablature, the Corinthian capitals, the shaft, and then the base. So um, I really love the uh, New York, some of the New Yorker uh, cartoons. And I think this one is kind of appropriate that defines the classical order of columns. So the, the way that they feature it is, um, Dori, Cori, and Io, the capital sister. So we have the Doric, which is the simplest column form. Um, it has heavy faceted shafts and plain round capitals. There's sometimes no base. It's sometimes just placed directly on the platform, which is called the stylobate. Then we have Corinthian, which is fancy. This is Cori. Uh, it's one of the most ornate columns and it's got a very fluted decorative capital, usually two rows at minimum of these acanthus leaves, and um, it's got some scrolls, right? Um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the scrolls. Th then we have the we have Io, and Io is slender, slender fluted columns. It has two opposing scrolls in the capital, and it's usually on a large base. And you know, the, they comically uh, represented these in terms of women, but they're actually, um, these are caryatids, which are actual commons that you can find in Greece at the Acropolis. And they generally use the column shafts were female forms. So uh, when you think of classical order, think of Dori, Cori, and Io. So let's, let's start with the Doric column. It, it's simple, it has faceted or fluted shaft and very simple plain capitals. Generally, it rests on just a very narrow, uh, very narrow base that's on the porch. This is, a, this is a concrete base. Then we've got ionic columns and this is a close up of those scrolls, these opposing scrolls, they are called volutes. This is an example, this, this has plain columns, but the uh, true ionic columns have fluted shafts. Then we move to the Corinthian, the fancy ones. Um, and this has, again, some scrolls, but it also has acanthus leaves, very decorative fluted tops. And again, the fluted shafts. And then the composite columns, which are really, really ornate. Um, they sort of combine the ionic with the leaves of the Corinthian and other details, little faces or gargoyles. These ones are gilded. They're pretty amazing. And there's, there are some examples of those around town as well. Then we have Tuscan columns, which is probably what we see the most of around town. They're the simplest, they have a plain capital and they have very plain, either rounded or square shafts. There's none of the fluting that's there. They're, they're really commonly found around our area. So let's talk about railings and balustrades now. Again, remember balustrades is the all encompassing term for your porch railing. Um, from the three story, multi-unit to the American four square. It adds detail, rich detail and curb appeal. Um, it also keeps people from falling off porches. Maybe, maybe these are a little more dangerous up there, um, but there's a balance then between safety and aesthetics. Well, so we'll focus in a little bit about some of the character of these 
balustrades. They contribute to the overall appearance of the building. Um, it, this is what you call your, your curb appeal for sure. And you can tell how the, um, the colors complement and really pull out the rich detail. These are turned columns and a more solid railing balustrade here. Here are some turned columns with the railings that are also mimicked up above in between the supports. So a rule of thumb for railings or balustrades is that the railings really shouldn't be higher than the windowsill. And you know these were created so that people could sit outside and look out and view their neighborhood. Um, they allowed an uninterrupted view to the outdoors, and that's that visual connection that's so important in our neighborhoods. The higher railings, which I will say are code compliant, this is what's required, they tend to look like um, sort of like clown pants pulled up too high. So, so this is preferred, but you know, you have to meet code in some instances. And the code is that when your porch floor this is the residential code in Ohio. When the porch floor is more than 30 inches above the ground, your railing height has to be 36 inches. So, so how do you uh, keep it from looking like this and making a little, making it code compliant, but a little more historic or, or, or relating to the historic character? And so one of the ways you can do it is by adding a top rail, a simple top rail above the historic railing. Or if you have to build a new rail, you put in another detail piece a little bit below that would have been at the height of the original railing. Um, and then you can get a little more creative with the, the type of balusters that are developed. Um, so it, it makes the, the railing code compliant, but it sort of harkens back to the more historic railing. So then we have to talk about the spacing. And that is that you cannot allow the passage of a four inch sphere through any of the balusters. Um, so the, uh, the old balustrades are not automatically grandfathered in, I should say, because some of these, like you might be able to pass a sphere through there. But if you touch it, then it has to be code compliant. So in other words, if you need a building permit to do any renovations on your front porch, your railings have to become code compliant. If you don't touch it, you don't have to fix it. So these are examples of the type of uh, balusters that you might see, um, the rectangular ones that form a nice pattern. These are pattern sawn. And this, you know, when the jigsaw was developed, they could cut out, carpenters could cut out beautiful patterns. And these are your typical turned balusters. Now on to the skirting. Um, the skirting then is something that um, is not only beautiful, but it's also very functional. Um, it anchors the porch to the ground. Um, it provides protection against animals and critters falling, you know, run, running and housing underneath, making their homes under your porch. It keeps out leaves and debris. And most importantly, it allows airflow underneath the porch because you don't want moisture to be trapped in there because that can start to affect the wood structure. Wood, uh, water is the enemy of wood. So this, you know, having a proper porch skirt with enough airflow can add years to your porch life. And the, the openings really shouldn't be too large. The recommended openings are between one and one and a half inches. Um, wood is the preferable material uh, if possible. We, you know, often there's the plastic kind of lath that's found at the big box stores, but it, it just doesn't look as appropriate in some of these historic porches. I wanted to highlight um, this custom porch skirt. This is, this is neither um, turned nor uh, sawn, but it's actually woven. It's this, uh, this homeowner took great pains to, to do this um, custom design and it is beautiful. So, you know, some these porch skirts are pretty and they really should be shown and not obscured with plant materials. Um, you know, if you have a skirt, a, a pretty porch skirt, show it off. Uh, this one does not, <laughs> but this one does. Um, and it shows that design matters. It's really important. The, the, the whole facade is improved by all of these elements. So now let's talk about architectural style. 
So Victorian. Um, this is between 1860 and 1900. It's after Queen Victoria, for, who lived at 18, from 1837 to 1901. And Victorian really includes several styles. It includes Second Empire, Queen Anne, Stick Style, Eastlake, and Shingle Style. It's, we probably refer to all of this as Victorian. Victorian porch styles often had projected uh, bays that had uh, windows and, and sometimes a second porch. They can be brick or wood. They had the fancy gingerbread details that we've come to really appreciate. Um, and paint patterns can accentuate all of those details as well and pick up, pick up the details. We often call this the gingerbread. So then there's Second Empire, and it's known for its mansard roofs, kind of a French influence, tall, ornate chimneys, very stately. Then we have Italian eight, which is like around 1840 to 1890, tall, round, or segmented arched brackets um, under porch overhangs, uh, hood molds over the windows, decorative hood molds. They can be in wood or in masonry, low pitched roofs and these eyebrow windows from the third floor. And um, just for information's sake, um, you should know that the over the Rhine neighborhood in Cincinnati has among the largest collection of Victoria ornates, they say in the entire United States. Uh, Victorian Italianates, I'm sorry. So worth a visit. Queen Anne Revival, 1875 to 1900. It's characterized by an asymmetrical massing, bay and oriel windows, and ornate porches. Um, and then we have the American Foursquare which is, we see an awful lot of this in, in Columbus. This was 1875, I'm sorry, uh, 1900, 1925, early, early 1900s. There's sort of a squarish cubicle plan, often four over four, four rooms over four rooms, usually two to two and a half stories and characterized by large wide front porches that span the entire front facade. Um, and the porch roof kind of echoes uh, the low sloped uh, hip form of the main roof. Then we have the arts and crafts. A lot of these are found in Clintonville. They're generally, they're from the early 1900s again, one or one and a half stories, kind of a horizontal feel, uh, well-crafted trim, a porch that is supported by tapered columns that are called battered columns. They kind of slant in like that. That gives it that characteristic feel. And then there's also the bungalow, which is sort of a vernacular craftsman style, not as much detail as the arts and crafts, but still the low gabled roof, um, battered or square porch columns and the porch across the entire front. And let's not forget um, hooded doors and stoops. That also offers a protection to the front entry. It's not a front porch, but um, it adds, again, a lot of distinctive style and character to the houses. So visual inspection is really important. Um, and this is key to detecting or identifying area problems before they become major problems. And we're going to talk about four or six major areas. We'll talk about the foundations, the deck and floorboards, and the joists, which is the structure. We'll, again, structure, we'll talk about columns. And I, I love this photo. I had to include that. Columns, columns not really doing their job. And then steps and railings. And we'll talk about the uh, beams and headers and roofs and gutters. So we'll start with foundations. Foundations, so um, if you notice your front porch pulling away from the main body, you might have a foundation problem. So again, this visual inspection is really important. It indicates that there might be some settling in the foundations. Sometimes foundations didn't go all the way down to frost level, or they were just stacked stone foundations, which shifted over time. And you know you might notice shifting column supports where people have to block up the columns here. Um, so 
It's important also to, if you can, to visually inspect the underside of the porch to notice anything that might be not proper. So in this one, you'll notice that this column is kind of half supported, not a good idea. And this is a particularly long span. These, these joists are spanning quite a distance. And so the builder put in these cross bracing, but also some intermediate supports that's just resting on two by fours uh, laid on the ground. That's really not um, a structural foundation. And there's frost heating that can occur and ruin any of the decking that's on top. So let's talk now about the deck and floorboards uh, in particular. The, uh, we noticed that the ends of porches, wooden porches and floorboards experience the, the most um, extreme conditions and weather abuse. And you'll notice a lot of the, the wood rot occurs um, at the front end of the, the porch. Even treated wood suffers that kind of damage. You, you look for cupping, which is um, the, the boards that are rounded. You look for splintering. Um, look for ponding water on your porch, which indicates that water is not draining off and your porch isn't sloped properly. Make sure you check under porch stands. If you can look underneath, check for deteriorated wood and possible termite damage. Um, the other thing that we would suggest is check under rugs and mats. Um, make sure that you kind of shake those rugs and mats out between seasons so that moisture isn't held under there. Um, let's see, let's look over here. I'm gonna go back again, sorry here. Um, the um, look for loose boards too as well. Even concrete porches can suffer um, some deterioration. And actually the, these are in Columbus. I, we've seen about three or four of these recently um, where the concrete porch deck has just collapsed. And in looking at it, um, we've noticed that there hasn't been adequate structure underneath. Um, so, you know, that you would think that concrete can last forever, but it can even span, it, it even has um, some span limits and needs to be supported properly. Um, this, this porch unfortunately suffered a lot of mosaic tile damage. So that was really, uh, they weren't able to save that. So look for, make sure that you notice when your concrete is cracking and the cracks are really telegraphing toward the edges, that's, that's a sure sign that there's some stress on your concrete porch deck. Next, let's talk about columns and porch posts. Damage to the column base is sometimes concealed by porch trim, but check to see if columns have shifted. Um, if the base is deteriorating, is there peeling paint, or these are, these are actually missing wood staves. This column was constructed by wood staves, but it uh, actually deteriorated so badly that they were falling off. Wood rot, failed joints. Um, if you are wondering whether or not there is um, uh, an awful lot of wood rot, what you can do is probe gently with a pencil, nothing, you know, nothing really uh, extreme, but just probe gently. And if it's going in, um, you know, an inch or two, you obviously have some wood rot and you need to take care of that. Steps and railings. Um, obviously these are in poor condition. Um, peeling paint, wood rot, um, missing, rails, missing balusters, balusters, um, you know, and this, this is not only safety, but if you start losing this, you're going to lose the whole character of this porch. Uh, missing steps, obviously not a good thing. These steps are pretty much intact, but they're beginning to show signs of wear toward the edges. And so they'll need to be taken care of. Beams and headers. This is a big one that probably, um, you know, beams of course carry the load and they distribute it evenly over the columns. Um, notice any sagging or cracking or separation, um, especially toward the center of the span, because in, this is an indication that, um, that the, the header or the beam is, is in distress and may need to be reinforced or even replaced. A lot of the old wooden beams were box beams. Um, so, you know, you want to, the only way to investigate that basically is to open up one of the, the trim pieces to just investigate behind. Now, actually, you know, this one here, they, they properly braced it so that it's not going to 
to uh, sag any further and, and ruin the port structure. So, um, and again, important to notice before you get too far, um, any elements of sagging or cracking that, that may need re reinforcement. Roofs and gutters. Job number one is to keep the water away from the porch. Do you have missing gutters? Have the gutters pulled away from the roof fascia? Are the downspouts clogged, missing, or not aligned? Do you have missing shingles, missing flashing? Any of that, all of that's going to contribute to roof deterioration, missing flashing along the porch. This I thought was interesting because, you know, very, very simply, sometimes you have a section of downspout that's missing. And in the wintertime, I don't know if you can see this, but, you know, the water had started draining through from the roof and it literally froze as it was leaving the, uh, the down, downspout. So sometimes downspouts also get misaligned near closer to the uh, to grade and a simple connection again would help take the water away from the house. So maintenance and best practices. As homeowners, your best thing is for an annual visual inspection. Trust your eyes. Um, you can check for, and I would check it, uh, we recommend checking it um, to change of season, spring and fall, for instance. This is a great time to start looking around and doing a visual inspection of your house. Check for peeling paint. Check for sagging roof lines, loose handrails or floorboards, as we talked about before. Um, look at the fascia and the openings in the ceiling, um, and especially leaking gutters uh, and, and downspouts. And we have had um, an abundance of water issues in houses around town. Uh, the incidences of heavy rainfall have only increased and I think that they will continue to because of climate change. So it's really important to make sure that water is handled and taken away from the house. Um, the other thing too, it's a simple thing is, um, you know, shovel snow promptly whenever a snowfall uh, uh, happens. Um, you know, that that also is ponding water. Cut back vines and, whoops, sorry, cut back vines and foundation plantings, vines and roots, hold water and moisture against roof materials and roof structure. They also um, reduce the, um, the ventilation that's required in and around materials so that they can breathe. And, you know, simple thing like also making sure that you um, move or remove a leaky uh, water, plant pots, plants and flower, flower planters from time to time because water then, you know, can collect underneath those and with that moisture, it can um, provide an incidence for uh, to cause rotting, and, uh, especially on non treated surfaces. Um, if you have any. Um, loose or deteriorating paint, it is important. You don't necessarily have to do a whole paint job, but scrape, sand, prime, and paint any exposed word, word surfaces. So deck materials. Um, tongue and groove it is used historically. Um, it really does define the character of the porch. Um, and this is a listing of some of the types of woods that have been used. Um, you can use exotic hardwoods. They have excellent durability, but they are extremely costly. You can use treated wood, uh, but the preservatives that are added um, that are good for insect resistance and, uh, and, and water resistance um, sometimes are susceptible to warping and cupping and splitting. Um, as we saw it at an um, earlier photograph. The other thing about using treated wood, it is less expensive, but it cannot be painted for at least a year. Um, and then you have the composite or the plastic materials, which are really weather resistant. Um, they're, they're excellent. However, um, a wood porch is a wood porch and plastic looks like plastic. Um, and so, you know, I would, we would recommend limiting an extensive use of substitute materials. And I, you know, I know they have a lot of good materials that are out there, but, but the wood and the tongue and groove was historically the wood that was used. Um, the other thing about that is that make sure whatever surface you put on, that it slopes away from the house and that the grain 
runs that, that is laid in the direction of the slope toward the outer edge. You want water carried again away from the porch surface so it doesn't pond. So with damaged sections, you know, sometimes you can simply remove and replace damaged sections with some new boards um, and make sure that they're feathered in. Um, but existing boards where it's more than 50% deteriorated uh, may require a total deck replacement. Um, with any new boards that you put in place, make sure that all six sides of the porch flooring is um, coated with primer, paint, or sealer prior to installation. That will really ensure that the, war that the boards don't cup or warp and it'll protect them in the long run. Columns, very important is these are the structural elements holding up your roof. And it is highly recommended that, um, that these repairs be done by professionals. Now, there are some things that can be done without uh, replacing the column. Um, some of the repairs can be done in place, such as the this epoxy filler, sometimes a, a, a resin or body filler such as Bondo. Um, also, uh, we would recommend before you replace any columns, remove and replace them, get a second opinion because you may, they may find that a simple Dutchman repair like this um, will keep you, will allow, allow the existing column to stay in place, just a small section. If you have to do a more major repair, and this is where you're gonna need um, a professional, such as a rotted base like this, you don't necessarily have to throw the column out, but this is where, where a Dutchman, prepare, uh, Dutchman repair um, is, is useful. It's where an inset is selectively replacing only the fault in the wood member with new material. And it usually matches the adjacent material as closely as possible. It's finished and sanded flush and then painted. So this column to this column, and you get to keep all of that original hand-turned column post. Holes, check for gaps and holes in fascia, soffits, and trim. Um, and it may take <laughs> maybe a set of binoculars or so, but, but notice even the tiny ones because the tiny ones get bigger, but the smaller ones are just an invitation for um, animal life, uh, uh, insects and critters and other pests. Uh, we live in an urban environment and um, our, our animals uh, are used to climbing up and down houses and they believe me, they spot these holes very instant, uh, very instantly. And um, this, this poor house here had an infestation of, I believe it was raccoons. So um, not a good thing. So make sure that even temporarily an aluminum patch such as this will be an appropriate repair. You just want those holes covered up and protected until proper repair can be done. Don't let this go for too long. Okay, and more tips and best practices. Do your research. Um, you know, if you don't have all the original elements to reference for your porch, Take a walk around the city and look for similar style homes for references on design, scale, colors, etc. So, so doorways between porches. This was not a historically accurate detail. Neither is this railing. But you know, they looked around the neighborhood um, and they maintained the existing columns. But this is much more welcoming than this. And it's it's reflect. It really is complementary to the style of the house. Materials and fasteners, make sure that you use exterior grade material, especially structural materials like LBLs and all um, to make your repairs. So, you know, keep as much of the existing as possible. Sometimes you have to do some beams, some new construction, exterior grade uh, to replace what's existing. Make sure too that you use the proper exterior um, connectors such as Simpson ties. And again, when you're using these, this is gonna be required in almost all uh, structural repairs anymore per code. Um, things like this really require more professional attention. You should really um, contact an engineer or an architect. You may be required to submit drawings to the city uh, for permitting, but this is gonna ensure your safety and structure 
structural stability um, of, of, your, of your porch. So you wanna go with professional help. This is probably not a DIY project. So more, um, more tips and best practices before you replace or damage any missing architectural pieces. The, the first thing we would say, don't throw away any, any element, no matter how bad it is, because it could possibly be repurposed or used as a template to, to replicate later, to make a new piece. Also, a very simple thing, and we, you know, we do this all the time, photograph the existing condition before removing anything. It's really good to have a, a history or a documentation of what went before. And this is often done by, um, by buildings, unfortunately, that have to be demolished. Um, they're, um, you know, you wanna make sure that you know what was there. It's very important. Um, take dimensions of the existing porch. Um, that's something that you can do or you can hire it out to be done. But it's important then, um, you know, if you're going to repair or replace it, make sure you take accurate dimensions. Put them on a sketch or a drawing. It doesn't have to be AutoCAD, it can be hand-drawn, but make sure that you, you take some accurate measurements so that you know how to put it back. If you need um, architectural elements that, that you, uh, or need to replace the ones that are uh, being removed, you can check local art, um, salvage yards. Demolition sites, um, you, you'll have to talk with the demolition contractor and sometimes you can make a deal with them uh, to purchase some materials that they're removing. I know a neighbor of ours went over and um, got some new brackets for her house by talking with the demolition contractor. Make sure that, that you talk with them uh, outside the, uh, the project area, uh, but they are in charge of all the materials on the demolition site, but you can sometimes negotiate with them and check antique shops, flea markets. Also check the internet for companies that sell and replicate or reproduce pieces. Um, so the other thing too with the internet is we have connections now to our neighborhoods through next door and social media. And sometimes a shout out to our neighborhood uh, for you know if anybody's got any missing railings or pieces that they're not using is a good way to obtain and find some of these old pieces. And then very often, you know, there some of the historic uh, wood trim pieces are very elaborate and you can achieve the same effect by combining smaller pieces, trim pieces together. And it can really closely approximate that which was um, the historic piece. And then again, um, you know, as we mentioned with the flooring that you prime and seal any new wood trim on all six surface, front, back, and all the sides. And again, especially important for the floorboards. So in conclusion, um, we wanna just emphasize that the porch is really one of the most significant features of any historic building. Um, they, it just defines, these historic materials define the character of the porch, for sure. We, the absolute mantra is repair first, replace last. And, you know, if properly maintained, these historic porches can last for many generations. They were constructed from old growth wood, uh, which we don't really have around anymore. That kind of wood is naturally insect and rot resistant. And, um, you know, it, we want to save these um, for future generations to pass on to them, to appreciate and enjoy. We want to be good stewards of what we have so that future generations can enjoy and appreciate that. And the other thing, the last thing I'll say about that is that, you know, it's, it's really any more the sustainable approach. We want, don't want to keep filling up our landfills with, with building materials. Um, and so, you know, with, there are lots of ways that we can um, work. We really need to be uh, conservators of our historic porches. There are many resources that were used in this and that you can um, look to as well. The National Park Service has what they call their preservation briefs online, and they have one actually on preserving wood porches. Um, there are books and many preservation consultants such as John Leake, he's got some great information. Um, Judith Kitchen, who is from Ohio and used to work for the State Historic Preservation Office, created a book called Caring for Your Old House. And then there's the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, so all of these are, there are many, many more resources, but 
um, you know, to help you go about your recommendations or your re renovations the right way. And as always, if you have any questions or you would like a site visit to come and see your existing porch conditions, um, please, you know, contact us at Columbus Landmarks. You can contact me personally, Eskini at columbuslandmarks.org. And we thank you very much for enjoying joining us on this presentation. So if there are any questions, we can um, happily answer some of those or you can write them in the chat box if you'd prefer. Hi, Susan. Hi. I have, um, we have the um, Tuscan columns on our front porch mm -hmm. and a couple, one is, seems to be pretty severely deteriorating. We were hoping to get it replaced, but we have not had very good luck trying to find someone who can actually do that work. Yes, and, and you're not alone. Um, we, uh, the Home Preservation Program has um, over the years collected lists of contractors in various trades. And these are contractors that understand how to work with older structures because it's a different skill set that you employ when you do that. So, you know, you can contact us at any time. Happy to make a site visit and share with you, um, you know, a list, a, a contractor or two that might be able to help you with that repair. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just don't hesitate to call. Happy to do that. Oh, do I have a chat feature here? Let me see. Oh, here we go in the chat. Sorry about that. Uh, I am. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, if the balusters are different colors um, and the whole porch needs to re be repainted, do I need to speak to a specialist painter? Um, okay, so we do, we do have actually a list of uh, paint professionals too uh, that can that we're happy to share with you. Um, I, I will say also that you know there are numbers of painters out there. Our, our lists are not um, exclusive. You know, we and there are many more people out there that know how to do this. So we're happy to share our list, but also, you know, you might as as you drive around or walk around your neighborhoods, ask your homeowners if they are doing a paint project. Who are they using, and who do they recommend? Um, so, but we're happy. You know, you can contact us and happy to to come out and visit and uh, and share any of our painters with you. We don't, somebody asked, do we post the contractor list? We don't post it on our website, website for a couple of reasons. And that is that the list is continually evolving. And, you know, sometimes we get reports back from homeowners that say, you know, this person wasn't very responsive. They really didn't do a good job with us. And so there's also some of these contractors that have the special skills that are required to work with older houses, they are getting ready to retire and they do not work, want the work anymore. So we have to remove those people from our list as well. So in other words, the list is continually updated, which is why, I mean, we're happy to share, but that's really why we don't post it on our website. So again, contact us at any time and we're happy to share that. So if there are any other questions, um, let me know. And um, I, I recommend on such a pretty day, walk around your neighborhood. If you live in an older neighborhood with historic porches, porches you have what, what people are desiring now, the safe, walkable, attractive um, neighborhoods. So this is a perfect day to walk around and, and, and observe and uh, take your cameras and uh, take pictures. And we hope that uh, you are inspired to do some work on your porch. And again, call us if you have any questions, happy to come out. Our, our services are absolutely free and we're not selling any products. So ha happy to help out in any way we can. Let's see. All right. Well, I think if there are uh, no other questions, I think we'll probably um, say goodbye. But uh, again, 
don't hesitate to contact us anytime if something comes up that you haven't thought about during this, this website. And thank you again so much for um, joining us on this presentation of Historic Porches. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, at future Columbus Landmarks events. And, um, and you also, I might mention to check out our website under the Home Preservation Program. Um, there are some uh, tips, little tip sheets there that uh, just cover some basic areas, uh, basic concerns that, that homeowners have with houses. So again, thank you very much uh, for your time today. And with that, I think we will close.